Begin journey, navigating the road to cyber resiliency. Welcome to episode two of Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, brought to you by Dell Technologies and their partners at Broadcom and presented by theCUBE. My name is Dave Vellante and if you watched our first episode, you know that we're delving into how to best protect your company and your critical data by developing the right strategies for your cyber resiliency via secure backups and recovery and cyber vaults, plus overall security education and awareness for all your employees. We have some great experts with us today. We're gonna to walk us through how to improve your overall security posture and your cyber resiliency. So today we're gonna to hear from Arun Krishnamurthy, who's the global strategy lead for resiliency and security with Dell Technology Services, with some expert security and cyber resiliency insights for you from his hands-on customer work with Dell Services. Now, Keith Bradley is the Vice President of IT and Security at Nature Fresh Farms. They're a fantastic Dell customer. They've got this incredible IoT and edge story. They've got this computing infrastructure and they suffered a really scary ransomware attack. And Keith will walk us through how they recovered and then hardened their defenses. And then finally, Michael Ambruzzo, systems engineer, Worldwide Technology, WWT, Dell's partner of the year in 2022, shares some excellent insights into how to assess risk, set expectations, and deliver better outcomes for your cyber resiliency. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Oh, organizations face a lot of obstacles when they're trying to get to cyber resilient multi-cloud data protection. Yeah, but it's a smooth ride if you're on the journey with Dell. You're funny. <laughs> oh, are there any tips left? Sure, here you go. Yum. Perhaps you've been hacked or you're just feeling exposed. For many customers, it's a bit overwhelming to try and figure out how to secure your entire state or even where to start. Well, we'd like to help. We're here with Arun Krishnamurthy, who has a wide range of experience across all aspects of IT management generally and security specifically. Arun, good to see you. Dave, Thanks great for coming to see in. you. Thank you for having me. So you're very welcome. So give us a quick overview of, of Dell services and specifically the cybersecurity piece in your role. Happy to do it, Dave. Uh, super excited. Uh, Dell's doing a lot in the security space. We've been doing a lot for many decades. Uh, what we are doing now is bringing together uh, some key services that will help our customers really tackle this big challenge in cybersecurity. Uh, we all know that ransomware is rising, many of our customers are struggling, and we see that across all segments, small business, medium business, com commercial, and even enterprises. Some customers may have a SOC and dedicated teams, other customers do not have it, but in general, this is a widespread challenge and uh, it's really causing a lot of grief for our customers. <laughs> we know it. I mean, yeah. the stats are you know, very, probably more than half the companies don't even have a SOC. That's and correct. so, you know, Dell, what I like is you end to end, right? Small all the way up to large. And we could spend a lot of time talking yeah. about the challenges that organizations face. And I think that's been well covered. But what we really want to do is share a framework. We have, we have a slide actually that you and I were looking at earlier, Alex, if you would bring that up. And I want to understand sort of how you frame the conversation, you know, what you've learned over the years. Sure. So look, uh, cybersecurity is really a risk mitigation conversation, right? Um, and what we've learned over many years of our experience working with our customers and really solving real problems for them, uh, there's, there's, this is one of the blueprints that's emerged for us in how we engage and talk to customers. Uh, there's three critical things in the blueprint that will help our customers not only prepare, which is pre-breach, uh, what do they have to do, and also help them think through, God forbid something happen, how do I recover my, uh, this is kind of the cyber resilience conversation, which is how do I understand both scenarios and be ready for it? So the middle of this is this, this, uh, this slide is where everybody has all the, 
the, the tools, right? We all know that, but, but start at the top here. This is where, what's interesting to me is you guys go in, you do a portfolio assessment essentially and evaluate the risk, is that correct? That is correct. So one of the most important things in cybersecurity is it is not just the CISO and their team that need to be worried about it. Uh, the top layer is what we think of business layer, risk layer. We want the business units, the IT teams, the application teams, the risk teams, the security teams, collectively working together and understanding what does risk exposure look for this company. And this widely varies between different companies because they are in different stages of maturity and they have different priorities. So we need to understand that risk appetite and exposure first, and then understand and build that strategy, right? How are we now going to tackle it? Where should we start and what does next steps look can, like? Can you bring that slide back up? Because I want to talk about the bottom layer now as well. So this is where you get into the, the architecture. Explain what you've got going on down here. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So, so this is your layer technology architecture. Um, and the, another way of looking at it is if you looked at some recent zero trust mandates, the, the NIST DOD model reference architecture for uh, zero trust also talks about this as different pillars. Uh, with the remote workforce that we have today and the remote target destinations that workers are going, which is multi-cloud, you now have a very diverse distributed workforce accessing very diverse distributed applications, whether it's private, public, SaaS, multiple forms. So how do you now connect these different pieces together is where some of the new technologies are evolving. And one of the interesting challenges is in the, in the old model, you had one data center, one firewall, you knew who was coming in. Once they came in, you kind of understood what they were doing. But in the distributed model, you have to build security posture along the way, right? If I'm a user with a laptop and I'm coming in, what applications do I access? Where do they sit? How do I traverse the network? And how do I protect every piece of it? So what you're looking there is the technology stack, and we want to make sure that every piece of that is protected. Okay, so this is, a, like I said, overwhelming for a lot of customers. So we've got another graphic that I want to bring up because where do you start? I mean, simplify, if you could bring up slide two, Alex, simplify for the audience. Like, where do I where do I start? Like I say, I've either been hacked or I'm afraid I'm going to get hacked. I come to Dell. What do you tell me? So um, when you look at it from a customer journey, our first priority is understanding what exposures currently customers have today, and we want to make sure we want to solve for that. Right. So uh, great example. We had one customer that had multiple domains, multiple websites that forgotten about it. So when we do our attack surface management assessment we uncovered that these assets were out there exposed for the bad guys to operate on. So let's understand the open vulnerabilities you have and make sure that we address it. And while we are doing that, let's also take a protection point of view, right? Let's protect what you have. God forbid the hackers came in, we are protecting the data. So can we double click on that second pillar here? Um, I, you know, that's something that we talk about often uh, on theCUBE and that is the adjacency of data protection to cybersecurity, our, our audience has, has heard that a lot. How are firms thinking about this adjacency? How do you think about it? So the, one of the critical aspects of data protection is the recovery component, right? Are we protecting the right assets? Do we understand what does a recovery scenario for a particular business process look like? So when we talk to customers, they have hundreds of applications they have some business process that has to come up, God forbid they had a cyber attack. So understanding the priority of the applications, protecting the right data, isolating them, and then having the ability to bring them back in an organized manner is super critical. So you can now prioritize those resources for the most critical applications. And from a protection standpoint, we also extend beyond data protection, which is where things like zero trust come in. So, and we'll talk about that, but so you're, you're essentially connecting the architecture to the business process. So there's a lot of dependencies. So there's multiple databases, there's maybe multiple tools that you've got to deal with. We always focus on the tools, but there's a lot of other things going on in, in the business. Uh, what about that third pillar? If you could bring that slide back up, that idea of becoming more anticipatory versus being purely reactive, what are, the, what are the keys there? You've got this manage proactively. Let's double click on that. So um, we, 
when you follow the journey and you have now protected your assets, you've closed some of the exposures, you've put the right controls in place, uh, well, you have to understand that every customer environment is dynamic. Users are gonna come in, devices are gonna come in, applications are gonna come in, and the threat actors are constantly acting every second of the day, so you have to manage your security proactively. You have to make sure that you're doing active threat management, you're understanding, through, you're bringing in a lot of threat intelligence, and, and Dell, for example, we have a SOC that spans 75 countries. We have a lot of different threat sources. We are able to bring that intelligence and understand if you're being hacked. If you're being hacked, we know what the connective points are so we can help you detect and respond very quickly. You know, one of the things that, you know, you see these frameworks like the NIST framework, which is, which is great, uh, but it's a lot. And I think organizations have trouble or operationalizing that. Is that something that you, you hear as a frustration and how can Dell help them actually bring this to reality? Yeah, so great question, Dave. Um, the, the frameworks are an evolution of what the industry has collectively understood over many decades. So they are phenomenal guidelines for customers. So NIST, for example, has five functions. And if you balanced your investments across the five functions, your security posture is going to get better. NIST also has controls understanding those different controls and how do they work. So with our services, we take a pragmatic approach. We have the frameworks as a reference point, guiding principle, but we also look for common cyber hygiene when we work with customers. There are some low hanging fruits you can attack and immediately increase your cybersecurity posture and then worry about the broader framework alignment and regulatory and other alignments. How does all this fit into, everybody talks about zero trust, zero trust is, is everybody's on the path to zero trust, but it's very challenging. CISOs tell us it's going to take three to five years, which is kind of depressing because they got a lot of other stuff to do. What's your take on zero trust? How does this all fit in? So first of all, zero trust is not a new concept. It's been around a lot. Uh, it's getting a lot of press now because the cyber attacks are continuing to grow and we need to find a really solid architectural foundation. That's what Zero Trust gives. So when you look at many security programs customers are running today, it's dependent on understanding a few good behaviors, but mostly customers are looking their needle in a haystack, is there a bad behavior going on? What Zero Trust does, it, it shifts the paradigm, right? Let's focus a lot more on the good principles, good behaviors, do we understand our users? What devices do they use? What applications do they have? And put the right technologies to make sure that we are, we are enforcing those good behaviors and it reduces the burden on catching bad behaviors, right? So that's the fundamental concept, but there's a lot of vendors with a lot of technologies that all have some aspect of zero trust in it. What we are particularly proud in Dell is we are kind of bringing them all together uh, so our customers have a better understanding of the roadmap. And the other thing is we find a lot of our customers are brownfield environments. Mm -hmm. So essentially where we are helping those customers is how do, we, how do we take those existing investments and convert them into a zero trust type policy and architecture? Yeah, so you mentioned needle in a haystack. Sometimes it's like a needle in a needle. Um, when people ask me why Dell, I'll often say that the company's obviously got great services capabilities. But I want to learn more about the ecosystem, particularly as it relates to security. So we have the, a third slide that I wanted to pull out of the deck because it, it really does talk to this. Big theme today in security is how do I reduce the number of tools I have? And there are a number of world-class companies that uh, can help you do that, can help you consolidate. And there's some listed here. Talk about your ecosystem strategy. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, one, like you said, it's a highly fragmented industry because each vendor has solved for a particularly difficult problem, but the burden is on our customers to put it all together. Uh, the other interesting thing about technology, security technologies, is they are not working on their own. So for example, uh, when you detect a threat, you want to cross-reference that to open vulnerabilities. You want to potentially cross-reference that to your penetration testing and how the controls are behaving. So what Dell is doing is we are working with the industry leaders and Dell is becoming the MSSP, the systems integrator, and we are not just working at the level of uh, putting services together, 
but we are working at the engineering level. How do I now have secure API-based automation? How do we bring these technologies? For our customers, we want to onboard these technologies really quickly, and how do they all work together? So we are playing a very pivotal role in bringing these leaders together, and collectively, we feel that we're going to have better better message for our customers and solve it. And making it easier in a very complex world. Arun, thanks so much for spending some time and coming into our studio. Thank you, Dave, appreciate it. All right, keep it right there for more content on navigating the road to cyber resiliency. This is episode two. You really can't take a wrong turn on this road. It's very, hmm, what's the word? Modern? That's it, modern. When you think of farming, what immediately comes to mind are the many challenges that farmers face. Planting, fertilizing, and harvesting. Drought, irrigation, and flooding. Pests, parasites, and pesticides. But cybersecurity, backup, and recovery for farming? Not top of mind. No one expects to be hacked, but in fact, everyone should expect it. Even small to medium businesses, and unfortunately, even farms. Current stats show that a business is hacked every 11 seconds. By 2030, it's estimated that an attack will occur every two seconds. So yes, even farms have to pay special attention to cybersecurity. Tune in for a short subject documentary presented by Dell Technologies, Nature Fresh Farms, Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, a special presentation from theCUBE. I'm really looking forward to seeing that mini doc. It's going to be available at thecube.net right after this episode. We're back with Keith Bradley, who's the VP of IT at Nature Fresh Farm. Earlier this year, we had Keith on theCUBE and we took you inside the ransomware attack at Nature Fresh. And we're pleased to have Keith back to help the good guys get more prepared. Keith, always a pleasure to see you. Dave, as always, great to see you too. My tomatoes are almost, almost there, you know, but not quite as beautiful as the ones behind you. Okay, let's review, yeah. let's review for the audience. You got attacked. What were the initial signs or alerts that made you realize that you were under attack? Uh, the first set of alerts that came in were fairly easy to see. Um, we got alerts that a couple servers came down, a couple switches went offline. And when I first seen the alerts, I actually thought we lost one of our core switches. It, it just felt like that to be. So I basically popped in and ran to the office and to evaluate and see what was going on. I figured it'd be a quick switch out the switch, put a new one in place, program it, and this, that, and the other thing. And when I got in the office, I started to look and I'm like, nope, everything's running. And then I tried to log in my computer and it didn't work. And then I walked by one of uh, the other tech's computers and I could see a, that dreaded ransomware screen up on the computer. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. And as things started to happen, it continued to happen. And uh, I just ran and I just pulled the plug on the internet and stopped the feed and, and started to evaluate where we were. I bet your heart rate ticked up a bit. How, how did the attackers initially gain access? I think it was through an open port, wasn't it? Take us through what happened. Yeah, so what had happened is we had a vendor set up a, a computer and they needed access to program it. So they needed to gain a port access to remote into it, to control the computer and program it up. Um, I had been on site in actually Delta, Ohio or other facility for them to do this. And I opened up the port, port was opened on a Wednesday. Uh, by the looks of the evaluation, they got in on Friday and by Saturday they were ex executing their attack on our network. Okay, so was there anything else that you discovered? I think you brought in an outside consultant in terms of like, so they get into the port and then what happened? Did they start traversing horizontally? Can you give us any more detail yeah, up to they, the point at which you got that ransom notice? Um, so yeah, they started traversing the network horizontally. They kind of went all over. They spread out, they gathered more credentials from the system 
Um, and at some point in time, they gathered an administrator credential that got them further. And then they kind of had the keys to the kingdom at that point in time. Once that happened, they traversed not only the Ohio network, but they also went through our VPN connection to the Canadian office, to the Mexico office, to the to the uh, Laredo office, and kind of took over everything. Um, once that happened, we, there was no stopping them. Okay, so you get a ransom note, and you didn't you didn't pay the ransom. Take us through that discussion. You know, why didn't you pay? Did you ever think about paying? What was that like? Um, when it first happened, we really didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to look at it and what to do. And that's when we started gathering our consultants, both from our cyber insurance that we had and even Dell Technologies that came on site to, to help uh, see things. Well, they didn't come on site, but they did things remotely for us to help us gather what do we do next. Um, there was a lot of conversations that the investigation firm had with the hackers to try to gain insight into what they got and to see what they got. Um, but we decided that it wasn't in the best interest to, to pursue it. And that was about uh, suggested by not only insurance, but most cyber attackers to just don't pay it. It's not worth it. And we were blessed enough to say that we were able to recover all the data that we were missing. So we didn't really need to pay them to get anything back. We just had to rebuild our entire infrastructure from the ground up and start going. So how did you manage to regain control? In other words, how did you recover? How long did that take? Um, so the initial recovery to get us back to bare minimum was, so the attack started about 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Uh, so about 6 a.m. Saturday morning, we lost basically everything in its entirety. By about noon, one o'clock on Saturday, we were able to pick and shift product out of our distribution centers again by our backup and recovery software. We had nothing more than that. We just had bare minimum to run and see where things are. Um, then we started to actually evaluate, okay, where is damage? What do we cover? How do we recover? What is the next steps? And at that point in time, we'd engaged with Dell to say, hey, what do we need to do this? And how do we do these steps? So it was a double dip. So they ex expedited our deployment of carbon black. So our carbon black was being in the middle of being deployed. Now we just deployed it everywhere. Found out what was the hash for the attack and the other symptoms they were seeing, and we just blocked it entirely out. Then we continued to just kind of rebuild things. And we continued to rebuild every moment of every second. And it basically took us till about Monday, Tuesday of the next week to, to get back to a point where, for the most part, the end users didn't know it even happened. Um, the longest part for my team was rebuilding probably about 300 laptops from scratch and some of them doing it remotely. So it was a busy time. Wow. Okay, so all this was a catalyst, as we talked about in, in May, to restart your journey uh, to cyber resilience. What else have you changed as a result of this attack? So we not only changed how we look at things, but how we do things. We now make sure that the vendors are much more compliant with our cybersecurity policy. We are much more adamant about what's open on our firewalls and how things are. Um, we reevaluated, and even though our backup solution worked to recover for us, we found that that six to seven hour window wasn't fast enough for us for recovery. So we actually went out and rebuilt our entire backup policy and how we back things up and how we recover. Then we institute what we call a cyber vault, which is basically a, a virtual air gap solution that not only protects your data, but analyzes the data to see if there's any hackers laying in wait in the data that is going into this vault. So we really, really started to look at how do we back things up every day and actively saying, we don't want to do this. We don't want to change the way we do it. And this is how we are going to secure a network. So you compressed your, if I understand it, your recovery time objective, uh, if, if I got that right. Did you change the RPO or, or were you comfortable with the amount of data that you were able to get back? Um, we actually did increase it. We uh, made sure we were backing up every single thing now. So every, every single thing that we did was totally backed up and recovered now. There were a few servers that we were kind of using but not needing to have recovered that we 
just rebuilt because we didn't do it, but now we cover everything from a simple user's text file to an AI algorithm that we have on one of our servers. And your cyber recovery, your cyber vault is, is you said virtual. So are you, are you thinking about an offsite air gap? Is that something that's in the future? Um, it's possible right now, again, the, the power protect data manager that we're using right now, that's nice and we like it, is we can keep expanding it to what we need. Um, the next step I think that we would do is we would have an air gap to a, one of our other locations. So we would actually air gap to two different locations, probably before going on the cloud, more because we have such a diverse area. I kind of like to say that we've built our own on-prem cloud to make things work. What would you tell somebody who, let's say was in the position you were Prior to the attack, they they see this discussion. They maybe see you at you know their Dell Tech World interview. What would you tell them? To what advice would you give them? I I would say to them is whatever you think you're doing today, it's never going to be enough. So you have to look at both sides of the coin. How do I protect my network, and yet how do I recover when it happens? because there is no if, it's always a matter of when. Like one of the things that I love from the intro was, you know, a ransomware attack happens all the time. And by 2030, it's going to be every two seconds. So eventually one of those two seconds is going to catch up to you. So be prepared on both sides, protect your network from the attack and be prepared to recover from the attack. Yeah, the statistics and the probability are not in your favor. Keith, you've always been a great friend of the Cube, and I know you've been loyal Dell customer. That sounds like they they were there for you in your your time of need, and you're repaying that with your with your your customer loyalty. So really appreciate you coming back on and telling your story. Yeah, I always appreciate telling you, and it's a it's a good story to, story to share. As I I feel like people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to acknowledge that it's happened and. If we work together, it's going to make it feel better for everybody. Fantastic. All right, keep it right there. We're going to have more content on navigating the road to cyber resiliency. This is episode two. Cyber recovery. Immutability. Isolation. Intelligence. AI. Zero trust. Just face it, you'll never beat me at the cyber resiliency game. Pretty sure that was a tie. You wish. We're back navigating the road to cyber resiliency. This is episode two and Michael Ambruso is here with Worldwide Technology. Michael is a systems engineer with WWT. He deeply understands data protection, DR, cyber recovery, architecture, and much more, Michael, thanks all for the rest up. of it. Good yeah, to see you. good to be here. So what's your role? Well, first of all, a little bit about WWT and what's your role there? So um, we're a large privately held value added reseller um, across the market. We were Dell's uh, partner of the year last year. And really we like to engage with um, our OEMs and our customers to obviously facilitate, add value and bring our expertise to bear to help customers deploy the best data protection solutions that we can. And, and large is an understatement. I think it's known that you guys are like $17 billion you know, company. I mean, yeah. very substantial player in the market. And, and really working to double every five years and just very focused on growing the business. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like insane objective, I love it. Yeah. Um, so simplification is a big theme in tech generally, but specifically in, in cybersecurity. When you work with customers, you know, what are you hearing? Where do you help them start? How do you help them get started? And how do you set expectations so that they're not trying to get too far out over their skis? Well, that's the important thing is setting good expectations, right? I mean, the first thing we need to do is, is look at what applications need to be protected, get a firm understanding of, of what needs to be protected, where the customer's crown jewels, help them understand what their RPOs and RTOs need to look like to ensure that they're going to be able to recover the data appropriately, and then um, develop a plan to execute on that and understand what those timelines need to look like so that when we do get into deployment, nobody's surprised. Okay, so so you start with sort of, is it it's a discussion? Is it an assessment? And what's the starting point? Definitely um, 
start out with a discussion because you always want to have a conversation, but then we can perform assessment. We do app rationalization studies, help understand the dependencies. Um, obviously, if you're you know protecting a large application, you want to make sure all the little pieces, parts that go in there um, are protected together, things of that nature. And then you know make sure you're engaging the right stakeholders as well in those early discussions. Okay, so you've been at this for a while. Um, I'm interested in the, the lessons learned from two perspectives. One is from the many, many years of experience you've had. And then the, the second is post-COVID, because pre-COVID, people talked about zero trust, but they really weren't serious about it. It was kind of a buzzword. Now everybody's on the path. And I think they're realizing, wow, this is going to take a while. Um, all this hybrid work, remote work, and I know people are coming back to the office, but still a lot of people working working uh, uh, remotely. So there's sort of lessons learned you know, pre and post, and yeah. maybe you can share those with us. Lessons learned pre, I think the, the biggest thing, again, is that especially in large organizations, this needs to be a top-down scenario. Um, if you try and work it from the bottom up, it becomes very difficult because the first thing you do is walk in and tell everybody that what they're doing is not sufficient. When it's a top-down perspective, um, you have to make sure that you engage both the security and the information teams, and generally at the C-suite. So it's a C CTO, CIO, and the CISO all have to be on board to make sure that that's going to work in a coordinated fashion. Um, and then the other big overall lesson learned um, is don't try to boil the ocean from day one because that's going to result in a project nobody's going to be able to swallow. Post-COVID, really, um, what we're encountering is that there's a much greater awareness in organizations on the need to manage that data and protect it. So what we're seeing is um, you know, more awareness of security out to the edge and the fact that data is not just always going to be sitting in the middle of that big data center in some centralized location. Also, we're really seeing post-COVID, a lot of customers have moved a lot of solutions to cloud-based and incorporating a cloud solution and understanding how to protect the data that's in the cloud as well as the data that's sitting inside the four walls. So that's interesting as it relates to stakeholders. This cloud has like now become the first line of defense for a lot of companies, and, and yet in, you know, cloud is code, so you get application developers that are actually being asked to secure, yeah. you know, the infrastructure. And that's not their- Well, that's their, app dev. It doesn't even need to be backed up. <laughs> right. No, no, no. Right? So, you know, Sam, so, right. so in terms of the stakeholders, how do you, you know, connect? You got the infrastructure, you got apps, you got business processes. Are you bringing in the line of business people? Is it the app dev heads? How do you deal with that? That, of, I think, is, is eventually what needs to be happening. But again, at the beginning of the day, the C-suite has to have a full understanding and then push that down from the top. This is where we're going in order to save the business. Because you have to remember, when we're talking about cyber resiliency, these are existential threats to customers' businesses. You may not be there tomorrow. You know, this isn't, oh, we're down for two weeks because hurricane. This is, oh, all of our data has been encrypted. Oh, all of our data has been exfiltrated. And that is, you know, it's a threat to the business that everybody has to be on board. And, and often, to that point, it often comes down from the board because they have the fiduciary obligation to ensure that the business is going to be there. They're very much aware of these threats. And the board and the CEO come to the teams and say, this is what we need to do to make sure we're here tomorrow. How much education do you have to do at the C-suite level? Because, I mean, I, there used to be this mentality of, oh, you failed, you're fired. And I, I think that's gone away, has it? And how much education? Less now, which is great. And in fact, at WWT, we're really starting to lean into tabletop exercises for that. It's really nice. We're developing a script that essentially puts you in the room when a cyber attack occurs and walks you through a typical response so that you kind of get a day in the life. And we found that when we do these kinds of tabletop exercises, especially with folks in the C-suite, they walk out with a much better understanding of um, the potential downsides of doing nothing and of what mitigation would look like. So it's like the empathy exercise. You put Absolutely, the, the yeah. C-suite in the SecOps yep. shoes. Yeah, and, and oh, by the way, what do you do when your chief operations officer is up backpacking in Maine when the cyber attack occurs? Ruh -ruh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and how do you permeate that? So you got you got top down, mm -hmm. and then you got, I guess that trickles up, you know, right? Eventually. And then you got the middle out, meaning you've got all these. Let's face it, bad user behavior is going to beat good security every time. <laughs> yeah. So how do you create that security culture? Is that part of 
what what you see organizations doing? Do you work that into the? Doesn't sort of quite or? fit into the data protection value. I mean, the, the good news is is that you know from a data protection side, I think for the last twenty three years or so, um, everybody's kind of understood that you have to have your backups. So if we can get the information technology and security organizations on board, the end user behavior of protecting the data is generally already there, which is very helpful. Do you think people? I mean, do they typically? They must underestimate the scope of the problem and what it's going to take in terms of human capital and yeah. budget, et cetera. Right, and that's it's really important to start setting those expectations early, understand what the budgeting looks like, and more importantly, what the timeline looks like. Because if you underestimate the amount of time you're going to need to spend to do app rationalization and understand what you need to protect, you know, the whole timeline goes down like a bunch of dominoes. So you know, getting those expectations set up front and that's something that we do a lot of with our customers at WWD. And those out of scope expectations that may be in the executive's mind, and you know, what's it going to take for me to solve this problem, right? right. You know, how much? Yeah. <laughs> Give well, me a and, number. And scary, and, scary boil the ocean yeah, conversations. Yeah, right. And what we tend to do in those cases is really start small. Say, so what do you need to rebuild your shop, Mr. Customer? Start with putting that in a safe location, tertiary copy offline, and then expand to what's the data that the business will be gone tomorrow if you lose it and then move on from there. So it's generally a kind of a better, best, good, better, best approach. So as watchers of the series know, know, a major focus has been the adjacency between data protection and cyber resiliency. So we've been asking all of our guests, where does data protection fit into that mosaic of cybersecurity? Well, if you look at it, and, and we've been doing it this way for a little while from the, the pillars of the, the NIST cyber resiliency model, um, obviously we're recovery, right? We're the guys that you go to to get that data back. And um, you know that's that's the key feature functionality where we play in, and one of the biggest changes there is now we're going from a, a small scale recovery anticipation to a large scale recovery anticipation. We got to get the whole business back as fast as possible, um, but we also fit into some of those other pillars, right? Um, anticipate. One of the key things about backup is it touches every bit of data in the organization, and if you can start to do analytics against that backup data, you can understand things like blast radius and infection time a lot faster. Um, so we definitely see a lot of our OEMs developing capabilities around that that we're then um, evangelizing to our customers. And then on the back end of that whole NIST cybersecurity model um, of being agile and learning to respond and kind of you know skate to where the puck is going, um, you know, the bad guys are not sitting still. They're learning, they're developing constantly. This is a constantly changing threat landscape. And if you're not, you know, every time going through and analyzing, you know, where could we make this better? What's changed? Um, that final pillar is, I think, really important to make sure that the data protection teams are engaged in. You know, so I, I do a lot of these types of interviews and people will often say, you know, look at the NIST framework and begin mm -hmm. to implement that. And, and that's obviously good advice, and there are other frameworks as well, but the customers sometimes have a trouble operationalizing it, actually you know, driving it through the business so that mm -hmm. it can be continuously improved. Yeah. Do you find that as a challenge, and how do you address that? Um, it's definitely a challenge because, I mean, organizations don't like to go, they like to go, okay, this is in the done pile, we're through, check. check. <laughs> we have a disaster recovery plan, we have a cyber recovery plan. And when you come back in and tell them, yeah, and you have to test it, that costs money, and you have to then sit back and, well, how is the threat landscape changed? And how do we need to change it? There's always going to be resistance to that because it costs money and it gets things out of the done pile and back into the two pile and nobody wants to do that. So yeah, I'm working with customers to help them understand that that needs to be done and modeling good behavior. When we first met, we were using this sort of football analogy. You've got two teams that are pretty equal. Yeah. And you're not going to get a first down on every play. You're right. not going to not punt. Right. Right. And they're going to. You, you use an analogy about watching film. What, what was that? They, they're going to watch. They're going to watch your highlight reels from your previous games and understand. You know what are you doing? And that's the thing. The bad guys are looking at all of the stuff that we look at. They're, they're evolving their strategies and solutions. You have to stay ahead of that. You have to keep working and understanding and getting educated. Um, and that is, that is really, really huge. Because again, you know, hurricanes are not out there looking for soft targets, right? Uh, the disaster recovery and cyber recovery are related, but very, very different in that respect. That you, you know, you're dealing with an active opponent 
who's evolving, who's changing, who's looking at your highlight reels, who's you know studying your plays. And sometimes it goes all the way up to state level actors. You know, I mean, as the time of recording this, we've got a lot of health systems in Connecticut that are just have no information technology right now. This is a scary, scary landscape, and we're not just spreading fud. So taking that me metaphor and, and sort of applying it, that's why I like the, the sports metaphor, because, yeah. you know, a coach will come up with some new whatever, with the, like the West Coast offense when it first right. came out, and then, you know, the defense had to respond to that. Uh, you see it now with AI. I feel like when you work with a company like a large company like Dell, mm -hmm. they had a lot of AI, they still have a lot of AI, but they maybe had AI, access to AI that the adversaries didn't have. Now all of a sudden, ChatGPT comes out, the adversaries have, you know, they start to, their light bulb goes off. I, do you think that, that in the near term, that all this AI buzz helps the adversaries more than maybe the defenders? Uh, it certainly makes it easier. It lowers the barrier of entry, right? Because if you're really clever, you can trick chat GPT into telling you how to hack a system. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have a lot of technical knowledge to do that. Used to be, you know, you at least had to understand the technology really well. Now you can have this, you know, AI spit out a script that will help you to subvert a system. And if you can subvert a system, you can subvert multiple systems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's really the scary thing for me right now is it lowers the barrier of entry and makes this significantly um, easier to repeat and to deploy these attacks. And we kind of saw this with ransomware for a while where, you know, you could go on the dark web and you still can and get ransomware as a service. And, right. You know, outsource your It's your a ransomware. business. It's a volume business. Right. Um, and that's, that's still my biggest concern is ransomware for service or ransomware for state actors because, you know, all they have to do is succeed once. And that's, that's why we tell our customers, you know, you have to operate under the basis. It's not a matter of if you're going to get attacked. It's a matter of when you're going to get attacked. It's not a matter of if they're going to get through. It's a matter of when they're going to get through. Because the good guys have to win every time and the bad guys only have to win once. So what's the one thing that you would ask customers to, 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 to not do and or do? Um, the one thing that I would ask them to do is to really Take this seriously and make sure that at the very least you have a tertiary offline copy of the um, information systems and things like that, switch records, DNS, I don't want to get too technical, but the stuff you need to rebuild your shop. That's square one. That's the important thing. And the one thing that I would tell customers to not do is to not, don't make the ostrich play. Don't stick your head in the sand and hope this thing passes you by. Because hope is not going to be a solution for this problem. And that recovery is not so simple, right? You got multiple databases, you got multiple tools, you got it affects different business processes. So yep. you really got to think that through. Yeah. Planning, planning, planning. Michael, thanks so much. No, it's been appreciate a pleasure. Time. Thank you. Great having you. All right, keep it right there. I'll be right back to wrap up and share some news with you. You're watching episode two of Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency. <laughs> You know, I don't think I've ever been on a road that's so simple to navigate. Well, why do you think I let you drive? Oh, you're hilarious, Emmy. Okay, today we learned about Dell's approach to integrated security and resiliency and what that means. Arun laid out key steps to take to become more mature in risk assessment and reducing that expected loss reducing that risk, and the importance of a connected partner ecosystem. And then we got into the anatomy of a real-world cyber attack, how one seemingly benign activity opened the door for a malicious event, but most importantly, how that experience reshaped Nature Fresh Farm's outlook on their security posture, their processes, and their entire culture for the better. Immediately following this episode, tune in right here on Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency on this website for a special short subject documentary on Nature Fresh Farms, their operation, their unfortunate ransomware attack, and how they were able to successfully recover with help from their partners at Dell. And then finally, we heard how Dell's partners, like Worldwide Technology, as part of their critical connective 
ecosystem are helping guide customers along the right path, assessing their risk, setting the proper expectations for success, developing individual plans, and working hand in hand to deliver positive outcomes for better cyber resiliency. That's it for today. Stay tuned for episode three, which will be live in our Palo Alto studio later this year in December. Thanks for watching episode two of Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, made possible by Dell Technologies in partnership with Broadcom. We'll see you next time.